Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Hartnett, Senior Director of Engineering at New Relic. For the past year, we have had the pleasure of working with his team on accelerating their migration of their infrastructure to the AWS Managed Services. Take it away, Andrew. Thanks, Colin. I lead the Managed Services Group, where we provide the platform services that New Relic is built on. I'm going to talk about our migration from our data center to AWS today. I will be following this agenda. First, some discussion about our before reality. Next, go into migration and modernization. And then what we mean by de-risking with observability. And finally, we're gonna follow this up with a panel discussion. So scale at New Relic. At New Relic, we deal with a scale that most companies don't and we have been growing. As of earlier this year, we ingest over 120 petabyte of data per month, with that number climbing by over six petabyte per month. This explosive growth, coupled with the increase in demand for our new Relic services, led to hard scalability barriers that threatened to make the mere act of updating this legacy software and hardware in our data center extremely burdensome. Enter AWS. So let's talk briefly about our architecture. To me, this slide illustrates the heart of New Relic. New Relic is a full stack observability platform that allows our customers to monitor, analyze, and optimize their entire software stack. To do this, we need to accept a lot of data from a wide variety of sources. Everything from instrumentation libraries embedded within customer applications, to mobile devices, to JavaScript code running on our customers' customers' browsers. Almost all of these interactions, though, come down to an HTTP request. So when receiving incoming data over HTTP, our first goal is to get it out of a socket buffer and onto durable storage as quickly and reliability, re reliably as possible. Kafka is a great fit for this, since it transparently handles both disk persistence and replication across multiple machines. Once we've got the raw data written into Kafka, we then feed it through a pipeline composed of various services that aggregate, normalize, decorate, or otherwise transform it before writing it to some persistent data sync. A given piece of data might transit back and forth from a Kafka topic to a service three or four or five times in our system before reaching its final destination. Most of the data that flows through our Kafka cluster eventually finds its way into NRDB, which is our custom telemetry database. This is then queried from all of our UIs and customer-facing APIs. NRDB ingests over a billion data points per minute and if you take that and consider the previous statement that each piece of data makes multiple hops back and forth to Kafka along the way to its final destination, it starts becoming clear that we need to support a high volume of data flowing through Kafka. So to review our current architecture in a simplified form, we get HTTP requests in a wide array of forms that supply incoming telemetry data from our, from our customers. These HTTP requests get handled by our ingest tier and written out to Kafka topics, topics in the giant Kafka cluster discussed previously. From there, the data gets transformed and aggregated in various ways by a collection of services labeled in this diagram as pipeline services. Most data in our system then finds its way to the insert worker tier, which is responsible for aggregating it and inserting it into NRDB. Finally, our customer facing UIs and APIs query NRDB. So delivering new capabilities on our existing stack became too risky and too slow. SaaS companies that don't constantly improve and deliver new capabilities don't stay in business for very long. So this represented an existential problem for us. The too risky piece here was 
a function of the poor fault isolation that we talked about previously. The too slow bit is really about the complexities involved with owning hardware, which were being felt organization-wide, not just on my teams. There's also a connection between the two. Nobody wants to be the one to deploy a change that takes down all of production. So having a single giant production environment discouraged innovation and change. For Kafka, we didn't want to just lift and shift our existing design to AWS. The problem wasn't just the ownership of the hardware, but also the scale of the environment. For our container strategy, we needed to move first as is and then modernize. The explosive growth I talked about previously, coupled with the increase in demand for New Relic services, led to hard scalability barriers. These barriers threatened to make the mere act of updating our legacy hardware and software in our data center extremely burdensome. As the leader in, our, as the, leader in the observability space, our teams wanted to continue to focus on delivering a platform that improves how customers instrument their systems, not on managing infrastructure. So why AWS Managed Services? You're gonna hear several reasons during this presentation, but by getting out of the data center business, we give a non-trivial amount of time and capacity back to our teams, allowing our developers to release code more frequently and develop new products and features that create additional value for our customers. Migrating to Amazon EKS and MSK allows us to focus on the customer experience better aligning it with our company's market position as the go-to solution for cloud, DevOps, and digital transformation initiatives. A reality of the mo monitoring space is that our workloads tend to be dramatically more write-heavy than read-heavy. Most of the data we collect isn't looked at, but when our customers do need to look at it, they really, really need to look at it because they're probably having an incident and are going to use the data that we have collected to inform their actions during that incident. This means that preserving the ability for us to service rights in a timely manner is our most important goal. Specifically, we needed to figure out how to not just move, but to partition it so we could have isolated deployment environments. This needed to be done incrementally as we were not going to be moving everything at once. We needed to design our migration to handle gradual data transfers into these isolated environments. This is an even more scaled down version of the migration diagram. In our data center, we have data flowing in through Kafka to NRDB. The presentation layer refers to the APIs and UIs we've discussed er earlier that surface data to our customers. One of the first things we did was to introduce a smart routing layer between our data center and our customers. This helped us solve the problem of incrementally transitioning traffic from one location to another. In this case, from our data center to AWS. We solved this at the HTTP layer outside of Kafka. Next, we created scaled down versions of our data center architecture in AWS. These mini DCs are all isolated environments, even down to being isolated in different AWS accounts. As this was being designed, looking at managing a single giant Kafka cluster to in many clusters, we felt it was important to keep the overhead of running these clusters lower so MSK was a great choice for us. While going through this migration, an additional service was needed to route queries across both environments as a single customer's data could be spread across several cells and our own data center. So the TikTok model was an approach used by Intel to alternate between improvement and innovation every 12 to 18 months. Intel focused on tweaking and improving an existing chip microarchitecture in the TIC and in the talk, they develop an entirely new one. This approach has been very successful in helping Intel innovate on new architectures 
while setting aside dedicated time for improvement and response to user demand. For this slide, I wanted to highlight the development of additional technology and services both before and after the migration. By adding the routing layer first, we learned important lessons before the move to AWS. And while in AWS, we learned important lessons before our move to EKS. So I could not have said this more eloquently. Since our move to AWS, we have, sent, we have seen a definite increase in the release of new features and products as we no longer have the same concerns having to operate and manage our own infrastructure. There are many different methodologies for migrations. For our migration to EKS, we chose to lift and shift and then optimize. This was necessary because there were some architectural changes to dozens of services that need to occur before we could really take advantage of the full suite of EKS features. Conversely, for our migration to MSK, we modernized first before the move. Again, the idea of man managing Kafka across several environments was a non-starter for us, and MSK was a perfect fit. So before the migration started, as I stated earlier, we created a smart routing layer. During the migration, we moved our, direct, our data directly to MSK and our services to our own Kubernetes system. We then took the time to update our services to take advantage of EKS. And then started to move those, to started to move those services to our EKS cells to take advantage of auto scaling, spot instance support, and the control pane being managed by AWS. So this may be my favorite chart, depicting both our migration and growth over the last eight months. I affectionately call it the Sherbert chart. This depicts our data volume flowing into our NRDB clusters broken down by environment. Not moving to MSK and then EKS, would have pushed out our timeline significantly while we tried to build functionality that those services already have. Some things to note about this slide, the brown section along the bottom represents data that we still have to move. The multicolored section represents cells that we are actively moving into or are already existing. And then the line represents the new relic introduction of a free service to all customers with the launch of Hercules. Again, showing dramatic growth here. Nothing that runs in production should go unmeasured. One of my favorite quotes from our leader, Lou Cern. By having a clear picture of what is going on, what changes failed, and when they failed, we can move at an incredible pace. Our observability enables us to detect failures and remediate in minutes. So de-risking with observability. As an observability company, New Relic systems are instrumented, which hugely accelerated our ability to make large changes at scale, such as migrating our core platform to AWS. With this visibility, we knew exactly where and when bottlenecks materialized. Rather than looking at low-level host metrics, our teams had visibility into the, into the topology of our systems and could look closely at anomalies that were developing in the system at real time. Our engineers use the New Relic platform to simultaneously visualize large scale data, visualize the large scale data migration from our monolithic private cloud data center to a microservice cell based architecture and fully instrument Kubernetes workloads to detect individual system performance across the whole migration. This level of, of observability and information gave us the confidence to move massive amounts of data in a very short amount of time and quickly switch production traffic to our new Amazon EKS environments. In addition, early on in our migration journey, our engineer, engineering teams used our own platform to understand our current private cloud compute needs. This made refactoring to Amazon EKS an obvious decision from a cost savings perspective as well. 
So visualizing change during this critical time was very important. When systems are going through massive change, it is easy to get overwhelmed with trying to monitor every metric, event, and static alert. There are just too many unknowns. To manage and mitigate the risk of such large system change events, app owners and architects need to have the ability to see their system in high cardinality and high dimensionality. Having a tool that can let you drill down into detected anomalies and give you the data to solve the problem is very powerful. These next three slides are views we use on a daily basis to manage our ongoing migration. So this burn down view we use on all of our specific data streams to track progress at a glance. So in this chart, purple represents data still in our DC, while the other colors represents the separate cells that this particular data type is being migrated into. It is very powerful to be able to visualize this sort of data. Not only is this easy to pass along for the real-time statuses of total migration, but it also gives you the spread across all the different environments, letting you know when new cells need to be spun up. This also helps with forecasting and estimating of AWS spend. So around service health, um, at one point, we noticed a recurring issue with uh, one of our brokers requiring AWS engineering to remediate until a Kafka hotfix could be applied. In a few hours, the team built a query which detected the issue in real time against the cluster's data in the telemetry data platform. From there, we sent the issues in real time to Lambda, which aggregated the data and then filed a support case with, with MSK. Giving AWS support not just notice of this issue, but all of the cluster information, log events, and data for them to quickly reme remediate the situation. This is just one example of our tight partnership with AWS. So I've mentioned several different reasons that we use and we drink our own champagne, um, but some more around NR1. So New Relic One has given us all the data insights and insights we needed in our migration journey. Coming soon, NR1 will provide engineers with telemetry insights from across the entire engineering lifecycle, including the tools they use every day. These tools like VS Code, IntelliJ, GitHub, Jira, Slack, and more touch the very software that ultimately reaches production that same software that we provide telemetry services and insights now. For example, New Relic recently reimagined its full stack observability solution with industry first capabilities that provide engineers unprecedented visibility into their complete estate. With zero configuration required, New Relic now brings together an organization's telemetry data from across applications and infrastructure into a single live view of an entire software system's health and performance. This enables engineers to quickly discover emerging issues and quickly take action to get systems back to full health before customers are impacted without needing to rely on setting alerts. This concludes my presentation on New Relic's consumption of AWS managed services. Before wrapping up, I wanted to add something important. The success of this migration comes down to our partnership with AWS. They have been through all of this with us, providing support and advice like a real partner. Thanks for listening and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Contact us at aws at newrelic.com. Next up is a quick Q&A with two of my AWS partners. Thanks, Andrew, for that presentation and that story. So I guess to start out with, would you mind telling us a little bit about the New Relic journey so far? Where are you now? Well, Colin, New Relic started our migration into AWS to take advantage of several fully managed services, including EKS and MSK. We have rapidly become one of the largest consumers of both of those services. New Relic initially migrated to our own Kubernetes clusters to run on Amazon EC2 in preparation for our eventual move to Amazon EKS. 
While under this configuration, we were able to quickly scale and innovate, migrating almost 30% of the new Relic ingestion in the first six months. Since the move to Amazon EKS, we have been able to speed up this migration even further and are now ingesting almost 90% of the customer data that we needed on Amazon EKS clusters. While our migration to Amazon EKS is still in its mid stages, the company is already running dozens of Amazon EKS clusters, including over 19,000 total nodes and more than 150,000 pods with plans to triple these numbers over the next year. For our move to MSK, we chose to jump in right away versus taking a lift and shift then optimize approach. The idea of managing and operating separate Kafka clusters outside of our own data center was, was just too much. Andrew, uh, New Relic is a leader in the observability space. What benefits did you get from consuming your own services in support of your migration? Good question, Scott. I call this drinking our own champagne. As an observability leader, our systems are fully instrumented, which hugely accelerates our ability to make large changes at scale, such as migrating our core data platform to AWS. And during our ongoing migration, we know exactly where any potential bottlenecks could be. Rather than looking at these low level host metrics, our teams have visibility in into the topology of our systems and can look closely at anomalies that develop in the system in real time. Our engineers use the New Relic platform to simultaneously visualize large scale data migrations from our monolithic private cloud data center to a microservice cell based architecture and fully instrumented Kubernetes workloads to detect individual system performance across the migration. This level of observability and information has really given us the confidence to move massive amounts of data in a very short time and quickly switch production traffic to EKS and MSK environments. Wow, that's amazing. Can you talk about the technology modernizations while you migrate it? Why did you move to Amazon MSK? You know, Kafka is a very tricky application to run at scale, especially at the scale you operate. How did you get everything worked out? Another great question. And yes, um, we had become experts in managing Kafka. Um, but why did we move to MSK? Well, first of all, we made a strategic decision to move away from our data center and onto a cloud platform to leverage these features offered by a managed service like MSK. With this approach, we were able to invest our resources in developing services around Kafka for our client teams, which is what we do best. We no longer have to manage hardware and software for keeping our Kafka clusters up to date. Secondly, with this migration to the cloud, we improved our Kafka architecture to be more resilient and to provide better fault isolation to our customers by having many smaller cells instead of the single monolithic cluster. For example, currently with 40 clusters in AWS, an incident in a single cell would only impact 1 40th of our customers. And about running Kafka at scale in MSK, we have a lot of lessons learned. You know, I'll start with automation, automation, automation. Our investment in automating away all of our ops focused day to day tasks have paid off in a really big way. When we started our migration and had a single cluster with five nodes, manual operation wasn't necessarily a had to have. But at 48 clusters and, 12, and over 1,200 brokers, that is no longer the case. Our investment in Terraform and Kubernetes has paid off both with provisioning and in service management. An example is our new self-service topic management tooling. Having MSK in place enabled us to go and make these sorts of tools available. We simply didn't have the time previously. This has also then led to less operational requests from our consuming teams giving us even more time back to go work on these features. Our investment in tooling and dashboards to measure what we care about also significantly impacted our success. One exa another example is uh, cruise control, um, which has ended up saving us countless hours on balancing our clusters. You know, revisiting our data pipeline architecture and 
making t changes to take advantage of new Kafka features uh, just wasn't available to us previously because of that lack of time um, due to all of the operational concerns we had to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have now learned that having these smaller Kafka clusters, they're a lot easier to eat to upgrade, um, and these new features really um, give us better levers on tuning performance and resilience. Andrew, this is an amazing modernization and migration story. What benefits have you seen now that you've started to migrate to EKS? Well, we've seen many benefits. Um, customers trust New Relic with their most sensitive and timely data. Uh, and by us relying on Amazon EKS, we can focus on our core competencies, competencies instead of data center and hardware management. For example, you know, anytime physical hardware is involved, that hardware can fail. Uh, with Amazon EKS, my teams no longer have to deal with these failure and recovery issues, which are now managed through EKS's automated tooling. That means no more waking up engineers in the middle of the night quicker recovery from failure and less downtime for customers, particularly during peak scaling events like Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Also, greater reliability and security increases customer confidence. Thanks in part to Amazon EKS, New Relic has achieved FedRAMP certification and is currently working towards high trust certification by leveraging Amazon EKS's image build capabilities and other built-in features. In addition, Amazon EKS itself is on the way to FedRAMP moderate high certification, which aligns with our plans to eventually achieve FedRAMP high as well. It's hard to discover emerging problems and unknowns when you're solely dependent on alerts or static dashboards to know what's changing. This is where anomaly detection can help. In New Relic 1, with zero setup, every one of your applications is monitored for anomalies in the golden signals of throughput, response time, and errors, and surfaced in your current workflows in New Relic 1. You don't have to add anything. It's just on. If you want to get a complete view of all anomalies in your environment, head over to the Anomalies tab in the Alerts and AI Overview. Here you can see all of your anomalies and dig into any individual anomaly for real-time, multi-dimensional analysis of your raw telemetry that explains the why behind the anomaly. Learn more about recent activity and entity details. Attributes to investigate are highlighted, and you can dig into anomalies found in upstream and downstream applications or other related signals around the anomaly. With anomaly data integrated directly into the telemetry data platform, you can create dashboards and alerts based on anomalies surfaced through proactive anomaly detection and even integrate with New Relic Incident Intelligence via Nurkle Alerts for deeper context into incidents. We want to meet you and your teams where you're already working. If you choose, you can send anomaly notifications to your collaboration tool of choice, like Slack, and quickly and easily jump to the in-depth analysis of those anomalies. Surfacing anomalies helps you find issues before they start, diagnose issues faster, and reduce your MTTR. Best of all, this is free, automatic, and needs no configuration. Well, thank you for attending our session today. We hope you enjoyed this uh, modernization and migration story. Uh, please make sure that you fill out the survey at the end of the presentation and have a great day. Thank you very much.